Welcome to Kharkiv City of Ukrainian Culture, an international conference in honor of Yuri Shevelyov. My name is Mark Andrejcik, and on behalf of the Ukrainian Studies Program at the Harriman Institute, I would like to thank you for attending what I think will be a very special two days uh, here in New York City. I'd also like to thank the Ukrainian Museum and the Ukrainian Academy of Arts and Sciences in the U.S for organizing the conference, co-organizing it with our program. I've been wanting to do, organize a conference on Ukraine culture and the city of Kharkiv for many years now. And then two events transpired in the past year and a half in Kharkiv that pushed me to realize uh, this idea. The violent destruction of the Yuri Shevelyov memorial plaque on September 25th, 2013 and the beating of Sidi Hijadan at a pro-Maidan rally just over a year ago on March 1st, 2014. So today and tomorrow, the Ukrainian Studies Program will be presenting a conference that, one, will feature an international array of presenters sharing their expertise on the city of Kharkiv and its important role in the development of Ukrainian culture and identity, both in the past and in the present, and two, the conference will offer a particular focus on two important cultural leaders associated with the city of Kharkiv, the scholar Yuri Shevelyov and the poet Serhii Zhadan. As for the structure of this conference, I ask that you uh, pick up, if you haven't had a chance, the program, the conference program at the entrance. Uh, there you'll find information uh, the, of the about the presenters and uh, the names of the panels. And you'll see in the program that uh, our conference will conclude tomorrow with a presentation by Serhii Zhadan at 7.30 at the Ukrainian Museum. We have a special program uh, set up there and uh, Professor Miroslav Shkandri will be taking part in the Yara Arts Group. Uh, so we're very excited about that. Uh, Serhii was our guest here at Columbia five years ago as part of this ongoing contemporary Ukrainian literature series we've been doing for about seven, eight years where we bring uh, the best writers from Ukraine to Colombia and to uh, the Kennan Institute, who is our co-sponsor, uh, uh, to present to audiences in the U.S. Uh, Serhii's central position in Ukrainian culture has taken on and then it's been further highlighted recently because of the political situation in Ukraine. Uh, and the war in Ukraine has greatly saturated said he's already a very busy schedule. So we're, we're, we're delighted that he was able to find time to fly in and, and be a big part of, th of this conference. During the day tomorrow, the conference will look at three specific periods during which the city of Kharkiv was or is especially important to the development of Ukrainian culture. Each panel, each period will be allotted one panel, and one of the panelists will focus on the social, historical, or political reasons for the spark in creative activity in Kharkiv, with the other two panelists focusing on the art that this activity produced. But now, working all the way back to the beginning of the program, I'd like to turn to uh, tonight's event, the start of our conference, with its focus on Yuri Shevelyov. And because tonight we have four speakers who offer in-depth presentations on Yuri Shevelyov, I will limit my short talk to a few brief points that look at Yuri Shevelyov through the prism of our conference on Kharkiv. A Kharkiv native, Shevelyov addressed the culture of his city in various articles under the pen name Yuri Sherek. Shevelyov's essays on early Soviet Ukrainian literature focus mostly on Mykola Khulevi and Mykola Kulish offering uh, fascinating analyses of the complex literary works of these two Kharkiv-based writers. In another essay that touches on Kharkiv, Shevelyov compares Kharkiv early romantic Levko, a poet, Levko Borovakovsky, to New York group poet Yuri Ternowski, demonstrating how the two writers are part of a cyclical inter interplay between tradition and modernism. And in perhaps his most famous essay on Kharkiv, The Fourth Kharkiv, written in 1948, Yuri Shevelyov traces that city's past from its beginnings as what he calls the first Kharkiv, a collection of slobodas for Ukrainian Cossacks who had become farmers and now lived in a rather idyllic patriarchal world of farmsteads that were gradually becoming part of the city of Kharkiv. Then to its transformation into a provincial city of the Russian Empire, a second Kharkiv, which served as a gate to the Donbass for Russian and French industrialists, 
but also as a gate through which the Russian Empire consistently attacked the city, robbing it of its Ukrainian identity. The third Kharkiv for Shevelyov is the Ukrainian capital of the 1920s, a symbol of a new Ukraine, uh, a Ukrainian capital of a Ukrainian Ukraine with its youthfulness and urban character. And this is followed by a fourth Kharkiv, inhabited by a Sovietized generation completely disconnected from that third Kharkiv and from its Ukrainian past. Very critical of this generation, Shevelyov nonetheless truly believes that there is an inner strength in people of the fourth Kharkiv with him whom a new belief can be sparked. In his essay, Shevelyov makes it clear that it is the people of the fourth Kharkiv that need to be focused on. If they could be reconnected to things from which they had been forcibly and deliberately separated by Soviet policy, if they could begin to think in a new and different manner, then they would begin a battle which they could win, and in doing so, create a fifth Kharkiv. So as we see over 65 years ago, Yuri Shevelyov had a vision for his beloved city and for Ukraine that's very relevant today. And it's not surprising that the scholar's writings and views and no less importantly, his persona are so inspiring for today's cultural leaders in Ukraine. Oksandra Zabushko, who in 2011 published a book of correspondence between herself and Shevelyov, writes that Shevelyov, like his predecessors Drohmanov, Franko, Khvilovi, and Kurbas, had always worked towards the spiritual modernization of Ukraine. Yuri Andrkovich, in an article addressing the destruction of Shevelyov's plaque, writes that Shevelyov was a fully free individual, a Ukrainian cosmopolitan man, who was able to provide a concrete example of a person who was open to the world. His refinement, intelligence, honesty, strong work, ethic, talent, mind, irony, and self-irony were strange and dangerous for Kharkiv's so-called anti-fascist leaders, and thus he needed to be cleared from Kharkiv's public space. Kostyantin Moskalets, in a speech delivered after receiving the prestigious Shevelyov Prize in December 2014, just a few months ago, sees Shevelyov as a person whose work can be trusted, who's incapable of selling out, and who knows the meaning of things and says meaningful things about them. Moskalets sees in Shevelyov an authoritative figure who inspires Moskalets' generation of writers to continue to create a vibrant Ukrainian literature. And finally, there's Serhii Zhadan, who was one of the activists involved in mounting that memorial plaque in Kharkiv on the building at 17 Sumska Street where Yuri Shevlyov once lived. Zhidan considers Shevlyov to have been an atypical Ukrainian. He sees in Shevlyov a fully realized man with an amazing attention to and recollection of details. These are based on memoirs that uh, Siri read. He is intrigued by how Shevlyov came to embrace and cultivate the Ukrainian identity. Jadan likes Shevelyov's urbanness, and he associates the man with a Kharkiv that is intellectual. Uh, Serhii Jadan points out that many of the acute issues about the city that Shevelyov mentions in his memoirs are relevant today. The coexistence of two languages and cultures within one city space, questions of provinciality versus self-sufficiency, development versus pressure, the need to move past the boundaries of a linguistic and cultural ghetto, the acceptance or rejection of contemporary art process, processes by the city's inhabitants. Jadan admires Shevelyov as a man who was able to reject systems that were imposed upon him by maintaining true to his principles. And so, Shevelyov, Kharkiv, Jadan. For the next two days, we will be spanning bridges between several eras and individuals that have made the city of Kharkiv a place where Ukrainian culture is developed and where the Ukrainian identity is formulated. I very much look forward to hearing all the presentations by our distinguished speakers, as well as to the vibrant discussions with you, the audience, that these presentations will undoubtedly inspire. Thank you. So now we'll introduce uh, our speakers uh, for tonight's panel. Uh, again, uh, the detailed Biographies, bibliographies are available at the entrance. I'm not gonna read them all. Uh, and I'll introduce each speaker as they come up and speak. So our first speaker is Professor Albert Kipa. Albert Kipa uh, is president of the Ukrainian Academy of Arts and Sciences in the US and professor laureate of comparative literature emeritus at Muhlenberg College. Uh, his talk is entitled Kharkiv's Native Son, 
George Y. Shevelyov as president of the Ukrainian Academy of Arts and Sciences in the US. Please welcome Professor Akiba. To speak about uh, George Yuri Shevelyov is a formidable challenge. <laughs> For he usually spoke eloquently, convincingly, authoritatively, provocatively, with a touch of ironic humor or sarcasm sprinkled on top. A difficult act to follow, but I'll try. For over 3,000 years, cities have been the centers of culture and creativity. And it is creativity and vision, both in the past and the present, that gives cities the ultimate competitive advantage. The 20th century urbanist Lewis Mumford, who lived in this area for part of his life and worked here, noted that, quote, the city as one finds it in history is the point of maximum concentration of power and culture of a community. It is the place where diffused rays of many separate beams of life fall into focus. The city is the forum and symbol of an integrated and social relationship. It is the seat of the temple, the market, the hall of justice, the academy of learning. Here in the city, the goods of civilization are multiplied and manifolded. Here is where human experience is transformed into viable signs, symbols, patterns of conduct, systems of order. Here is where the issues of civilization are focused. Here too, ritual passes on occasion into the active drama of a fully differentiated and self-conscious society. Well, Kiev, Kharkiv, and Lviv are, oh, that was the end of quote, sorry. Kiev, Kharkiv, and Lviv are Ukraine's leading cultural, social, political, and economic centers. Generally speaking, Lviv is perceived as Ukraine's most Ukrainian city, Kiev as relatively safe in its Ukrainian identity, and Kharkiv, despite its, despite its entrenched Ukrainian roots and pulsating phases, as a city between two cultures, an egregiously precarious position today in the Russia-Ukraine debacle. Thus, I applaud the initiative of Dr. Mark Andrejcik in Columbia's Ukrainian Studies Program at the Harriman Institute for convening this conference to examine Kharkiv's role in the past and the present in the formation of today's Ukrainian identity, a distinctiveness once again in crises, to put it mildly, and to dedicate it, and that is to offer the conference and to dedicate it to the memory of Yuri Shevelov. Despite Kharkiv's geographic proximity to Russia proper and the Donbass, the city was and remains an important center of ardent Ukrainian cultural activity. Key Ukrainian cultural figures lived and worked in Kharkiv. Kvitka Osnavienko, Hula Kartemovsky, Kostomarov, Hrabovsky, Hrinchenko, Totebnya, Michnovsky, Les Kurbas, Mykola Kulish, Mykola Khvilovei, Volodymyr Sosura, just to name a few, I have to drop some names, and of course, Yuri Volodymyrovich Shevelov, also known as George Shevelov and Yuri Sherek. George Shevelov, a towering culturally endowed and scholarly figure, a razor sharp intellect, ethical and honorable, an internationally acclaimed linguist and literary critic, a man of the city, particularly Kharkiv, and later New York, with two sojourns in between in Lund and Boston. Shevelov was born in Kharkiv, and his mother incorrectly uh, apparently misstated his birthplace to be Lomza, Poland, but on, on purpose in order to escape uh, persecution, and spent most of his life in Ukraine in Kharkiv, which left indelible marks on his psychic and intellectual makeup. Initially raised in the Russian-oriented ethnic stream, he subsequently embraced the Ukrainian cultural environment, which to a great extent was to determine his life's role as a consciously Ukrainian individual, champion and promoter of the Ukrainian language and culture. He attributes his conversion to his sister's fiance's influence as well as Kharkiv's cultural amenities to the works of Lesia Ukrainka, Pavlo Tychina, Yuri Yanovsky, and the production of Berezil, the Ukrainian theater studio Les Kurbas. Particulars about this you would find in his uh, memoirs, Ya, Mene, Meni, Idokruhi, um, as well as in the essay that Mark mentioned about uh, uh, 
Третій Харків. Шевельов left Kharkiv in February 1943, stopping in Lviv, then, then moved westward to Poland, Slovakia, and finally Germany, where he obtained a doctorate at the Ukrainian Free University in Munich and continued his pre-war scholarly activities. After two-year intern lectureships, rather, first at Lund University in Sweden and then at Harvard, Shevelov in 1954 arrived in New York to teach at Columbia, from which he retired in 1977 as Professor Emeritus of Slavic Philology. In New York, George Shevelov reactivated his association with the Ukrainian Free Academy of Arts and Sciences, also known by its Ukrainian acronym UVAN, Ukrainska Vilna Akademia Nauk, and its official English name reads the Ukrainian Academy of Arts and Sciences in the U US Incorporated. He had previously been one of the presenters at Uvan's first Shevchenko conference in 1946 in Augsburg, Germany. Uvan continued Kiev's academic tradition in exile, particularly in North America, a tradition rooted in the active lives of Kiev society, culminating in the founding of UAN, Ukrainska Akademia Nauk, the Ukrainian Academy of Science, in 1918, an institution subjected to persecution from the late 1920s and subsequently reborn in post-war Germany in 1945 and five years later in the United States and Canada. At Shevelov's election to the presidency of Uvan in 1959, upon the death of uh, his predecessor Vietuhil, the Academy had had a decade of indefatigable toil during which a group of distinguished scholars and cultural activists labored intensively to advance free, objective, impartial scholarship and the arts on matters Ukrainian, to ensure for it an appropriate role or recognition in the world, and to counteract Soviet falsification and propaganda. To cite Shevelov's address at the 50th anniversary celebration of Uvan, I quote, the very existence of the Academy and its publications had a major constructive influence on its counterpart in Kiev. Uvan's numerous publications compelled Kiev, that is the Ukrainian Academy of Sciences, UAN, to undertake and publish studies which would most likely not otherwise have seen the light of day. Directly and indirectly, the Academy in exile dictated Kiev's scholarly repertoire in Ukrainian studies. Kiev felt challenged and provoked by Uvan, but it was Uvan which led the way and the day." End of quote. Perhaps the most telling backhanded compliment to Uvan's research and publication activity was a article or a response by Ivan Khmel entitled Under the Pretense of Scholarship, published in Vistis Ukraini in 1982. Quote, all of Uvan's scholarly research aimed at pitting Soviet authorities constituted by workers and peasants of Ukraine in 1917 under the flag of the Great October Revolution, pitting against the Ukrainian bourgeois nationalist Contra Revolution, having reconstituted it as a national revolution. End of quote. Clearly, it was the Academy's good fortune to have Chevalot a prominent representative of the generation of the 20s and 30s, the so-called Rastriline Vidrodzhina, or Executed Renaissance, and professor at Columbia University as its president. He served three presidential terms, from 1969 to 61, and from uh, 1979 to 1987. There are, in, in basically, um, <clears throat> others, in many sources, there are various dates given, but clearly the dates are 59 to 61 and 79 to 87 um, of the 20th century. He strove to involve Ukrainian scholars and professors of the post-war post generation at American universities, as well as to attract leading non-Ukrainian scholars to address the perils and potentials of Ukrainian studies from their perspectives. Uh, for example, in 1960, Zig Zygniew Brzezinski, Stig Wikander, Alexander Dalin, Oskar Halevsky all presented lectures at Uvan and participated in discussions. Chevelot considered research and publication the Academy's most important tasks and valued the results. To quote him, it is 
difficult to find inferior works among the Academy's publications. They are formidable guardians towering in the defense of the Ukrainian political movement and Ukrainian culture. And it's not due to journalistic outbursts, but based on truthful facts and thoughtful analyses." End of quote. In particular, the Academy's annals rank as its most significant English language publication. Established in 1951, the annals became the first scholarly and scientific periodical devoted to topics in Ukrainian studies. As noted in the introduction of volume one, the first issue of the annals of the Ukrainian Academy is one of the Academy's project, is one of the Academy's project, projects which bear witness to our determination that Ukrainian science and learning shall continue to flourish and develop and that they make their contribution to the science and learning of the entire free world." End of quote. In 1959, Chevalot proposed a new editorial approach for the journal. Dedicate each volume to a specific field of knowledge and let it become an international forum involving scholars from around the world for the objective examination and elucidation of Ukrainian and Eastern European topics. The first issue under the new orientation featured studies by leading international linguists on various aspects of the structure and development of the Ukrainian language. In 1983, volume 15 of the Annals, Studies in Ukrainian Linguistics in Honor of George Y. Shevelov, is a prime example of the new, editorials, of the new editorial policies enduring success and as such a most befitting tribute to the man of the hour. I should mention that last year the, we did finally put up all of the issues of, of the annals on the internet and they are available at Uvan's uh, uh, internet homepage, uh, uvan.org. And uh, text can be, all the texts, the English language texts and the annals, in other words, all volumes of the annals are available in the internet for use, free of charge. In 1959, the Academy began the important task of organizing and categorizing the archives of Volodymyr Venichenko, which were then housed at Columbia University, today back at Uvan. In the first decade of Uvan's existence, the archival and library holdings of the Academy had outgrown its rented space in lower mid-Manhattan. Consequently, in 1960, Uvan began searching for per a permanent home and fortuitously discovered a former branch building of the New York City Public Library on sale on 100th Street off Broadway on Manhattan. The situation required Shevelov to engage in fundraising activities, a task basically incompatible with his natural disposition. Nevertheless, his, essent his essentially private personality rose to the occasion in its own inim inimitable, urbane, and sophisticatedly charming way. The money was, with the involvement of other people, of course, as well, but the money was raised, the building acquired in 1961. Uvan, a center of Ukrainian scholarship and a source of information about Ukraine, Ukrainian studies and cultures, now had a permanent home. To commemorate the centennial of Taras Shevchenko's death, Shevelov and Volodymyr Miyakovsky edited a volume entitled Taras Shevchenko, 1814 to 1861, a symposium which strove, quote, to present various aspects of Shevchenko's work and life as seen from the distance of a century, end of quote. Authors were given two approaches to consider, either to concentrate on summing up the research done and stating the present state of knowledge, or to advance new points of view and outlining new vistas in research. The following publication projects were initiated by Shevelov at various stages of his presidency, and in most cases continued beyond them. An annual bibliography of publications on Ukrainian topics appearing in the free world. The Proceedings of Uvan, which were collections of lectures given at Uvan. Studies highlighting our past, Nasha Menule, and drawing on Uvan's extensive archival collection. And bilingual brochures, lectures and notes, offering materials from the scholarly conferences sponsored by Uvan. In 1981, citing the unique value of the Academy's archives, Shevelov began a new series under the general title Sources Regarding Recent Ukrainian History, 
which was to address at least some of the historical facts and periods which were either falsified or ignored, denied, passed over uh, by then contemporary Soviet scholarship. Since most major universities and public libraries in the United States and Europe at that time subscribed to one's publications, Shevelov envisioned a series of serving contemporary and future scholars of the world as well as interested laymen in the search for the truth about Ukraine and its history and ultimately penetrating the Iron Curtain to some extent reaching Ukraine. The first volume in this series was dedicated to Volodymyr Myakovsky, one of the founding members of Uvan and the initiator and organizer of its copious and unique distinctive archives. Five volumes were planned for this series. For this series. Three were published. The editors were Marko Antonovich, Taras Hunchak, Bogdan Struminski, and Marta Skorupska. Of special interest to this conference, participants might be the following. During the academic year 81-82, Shevelov initiated a new series of lectures dedicated to individual cities of Ukraine, particularly Kiev, Kharkiv, Lviv, and Odessa. The main purpose of the series was to explore aspects of Ukrainian history from a regional perspective and to highlight Ukraine's urban cultural constituent foundations. The details of those are in the Ukrainian, are in the archives at Uvan. In 1986, at the suggestion of Shevelov, Uvan marked the 125th anniversary of the Ukrainian academic tradition. A conference, this is in the academy tradition, I should say. A conference devoted to the topic took place in March and was followed by presentations about prominent scholars and institutions who cultivated the tradition of which Uvan humbly considered itself to be heir apparent. All, all presentations were subsequently published in a 462-page volume edited by Marko Antonovich and entitled 125 Years of the Kievan Ukrainian Academic Tradition. 1861 to 1886. At the same time, Shevelov was one of the first who ventured to link the future of the academy with independent Ukraine, say, qu saying, quote, if only Ukraine would prosper and its leaders realize what culture and cultural heritage represent. This came, of course, after the um, Ukraine's pronouncement of independence. Shevelov's association with Ovan of course, went beyond his presidential terms of office. <clears throat> Over the years, he, represented at, he presented at least 20 lectures, wrote introductions to many Uvan publications, participated in numerous scholarly discussions in which its standards were consistently high, and his val evaluation of colleagues could be devastatingly outspoken if, he seemed, if it seemed to him that it, that was what was called for. His administrative leadership style can perhaps best be characterized by what he called in his memoirs the second bench complex, the need to recede into the background but never into the last place. He shared his visions for the institution, inspired, stimulated, challenged intellectual discourse, encouraged sound scholarship and dedication in the pursuit of truth and integrity in work and life. He himself did it by example through the power of the word of the pen. As my predecessor at Uvan, the physicist Alexa Bilanyuk put it, quote, Professor Shevelov's scholarly output could be compared to that of an entire academic institute. He wrote an etymology, morphology, he wrote on my etymology, morphology, phonology, and syntax of such Slavic languages as Church, Slavonic, Macedonian, Serbo-Croatian, Slovak, Polish, Russian, and most extensively Ukrainian. In his signal work, a historical phonology of the Ukrainian language, published in 1979, Professor Shevelov took issue with the habitual Russian theory and showed that the Ukrainian language has had its own characteristic development from early on, on par with that of other great Slavic languages." End of quote. Shevelov's legacy is, of course, his work for and devotion to his consciously chosen culture. He was a witness and remains an authority on Ukrainian culture and linguistics to be reckoned with. As uh, Jürgen uh, Udolf of the University of Göttingen, Göttingen state, stated in his review of Shevelov's just mentioned magnum opus, I quote, sorgfältige Berücksichtigung des urkundlichen Materials, umfassende Kenntnis der dialektalen Erscheinungen, 
ausführliche Darstellung der innerukrainischen Verhältnissen und der parallelen in verwandten und benachbarten Sprachen zeigen sich auf Schritt und Tritt. Eine hervorragende, beispielhafte Arbeit, die unsere Kenntnis über das Ukrainische auf eine neue, solide Grundlage gestellt hat. Die Slavistik und in der Germanistik wird von diesem Werk noch lange profitieren. Quick paraphrasal translation. Careful consideration of documentary materials, comprehensive knowledge of dialect manifestations, detailed depictions of circumstances within Ukraine and parallels in related and circumjacent languages are presented at every step. An outstanding exemplary work which was given which has given our knowledge and understanding of Ukrainian a new solid foundation. Slavic and Indo-Germanic studies will profit from this work for a long time to come. A tribute to Shevelov's brilliance and uniqueness and summa summarum to his role as a spirit of place, a genius Loki, a powerful presence at Uvan and Colombia and the world. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Kipa. Our next uh, speaker is uh, Tatyana Shostopalova. She's professor of Ukrainian uh, literature department at uh, Luhansk uh, National University. And we're very lucky uh, that uh, Professor Shostopalova has been here at uh, the Harriman Institute at Columbia as a Fulbright scholar this year. And she, in fact, has been researching uh, the archives of Yuri Shevulov. Uh, so please welcome uh, Tatyana Shostopalova. Thank you. Good evening. Yuri Shevelov was born on December 17, 19, sorry. Nineteen o eight in Kharkiv, the city that became an indivisible part of his life. When he was one year old, his family moved to the town of Lomja, Poland. At the beginning of the First World War, the family broke up forever. His father, Volodymyr Schneider, remained in the service, while Varvara Volodymyrovna, born mother, with the two children, Yuri and his older sister Vera, returned to Kharkiv, where she was born. They first rented an apartment on um, 112 Sumska Street, owned by, by Kulbakin, a professor of Slavic philology at Kharkiv University. This fact, uh, Shevelov viewed as a, predict, a prediction for his future academic career. Eventually, they moved to a larger five-room apartment between the Rimarska Street and Sumska Street, uh, the so-called Salamander House. After the October Revolution in 1917, when one of the many Soviet institutions occupied the apartment, the Shevelovs were forced to settle in the smallest room designed for the maid. Here they lived until 1943. Describing his childhood and youth, Shevelov tells us that it was during his first year of the gymnasium that the two decisive complexes which defined his personality for life were formed. The so-called second bench complex, complex Drugui party, and the Wichlinsky complex. The first meant the repudiation of personal ambitions there was no, no need to make oneself no noticeable when, I quote, good work could just as well be done from the position of the second bench. The second, the Wichlinsky complex, arose from a blow below the belt, a kick uh, in the groin by another boy. From this, he learned the significance of the domination of savage force 
over civil, uh, civilized thinking and behavior that spread to Red Kharkiv and all of Ukraine after the revolution. In time, he realized his insurmountable aversion to animal cruelty, malice, and merciless brutality, that which made human beings dehumanized and faceless prod products of totalitarianism. The Wichlinsky complex separated Shevelov forever from crowds willing to tolerate aggression and violence. It was the reason why he did not become a Soviet agent and why later in life he had the strength to rise above any humiliating confrontation with Ivan Belodid and Roman Jakobson, who accused him unjustly of collaboration with the Nazis. Shevelov considered both of these complexes in himself as incurable. They shifted the subconscious, зрушили мою підсвідомість, affected him more than his teachers and mentors, defined his understanding of existence and of the world. In his unique personal memoirs with the existential title, I, myself, to me, and all around, he admits that already in his earliest youth, Kharkiv forced him to immerse himself into the process of trying to gain an understanding of the significance and symbolism of those years. He writes, only much later, beyond the boundaries of the Soviet system, did I realize that it, is what, that, that it was not just a question of joining that system. It was an entry into life into the mass society of 20th century, where the single man lost his values, where Jews were murdered only because they were Jews, and where terror was used simply for the sake of terror. The Jewish theme in his consciousness, strongly recognizable in Shevelov's mature work, was also born in Kharkiv. He, his memoirs include numerous sympathetic descriptions on his Jewish teachers and friends during his school years. His first highly respected private teacher, Mark Samoilovich Yelecki, and his son, Vale, friends Misha Barmas and Tosia Zumin, two very special friends at the university, Misha Finkel and Misha Tetyevsky, Lev Dohatko and Lucia Bychowska, a young woman, woman of great intelligence and love of literature. Indeed, his first erotic feelings were aroused by Asia Pershina, a Jewish girl of Russian culture with whom he studied at a school of trade and industry. The three Mishas, Barmas, Finkel, Tatyevsky, he recalled often as his best friends with whom he spent many hours during his university days. Much later, already abroad, there were many others. He collaborated very closely, especially with Israel Kleiner, Paul Wexler, Moise Fishbein, and spoke warmly of his particular friendship with the Harvard Polonist Victor Weintraub and his wife. Shevelov wrote that he had never had a specific aim to find friends among Jewish people, but that he did not consider it a coincidence that he did. Jews attracted his attention in their closeness to cosmopolitanism and their fertile intellectual minds. Russian speaking, they spontaneously learned Ukrainian and appreciated Ukrainian culture. They were also mostly members of the urban environment rather than representatives of the rural, rustic, peasant world which was alien to Shevelov's mentality and which, and which in his earliest youth he actually despised. I quote, nothing divided me from my Jewish friends. We were not strangers, 
ми були свої. Just as they, I did not hear blams beyond the village, не пас ягнята за селом. This psychological complex was alien to me. I don't rule out the fact that the speed of their reactions far greater than that of my Ukrainian friends and acquaintances or the quick reaction of the French in comparison to the Americans were close to my heart." Unquote. That impressed him most, what impressed him most among his Jewish friends was their ability to retain their Jewish identity while effortlessly responding to and embracing the cultural values of their adopted nations. It was this in particular that influenced the formation of Shevelov's own critical focus, his conviction that the world of Ukrainian cultural achievements must be enhanced by the cultural achievements of other nation. Significantly, then Shevelov enumerated the personalities most important to him in Kharkiv. He placed in the same category his professors at the University, Alexander Bilecki, Leonid Bulachowski, and Agapi Shamrai, Les Kurbas and the Brazil Theater, Mikhail Boychuk and his school of painting, Oleksandr Dovzhenko and his friendship and conversations with his three Jewish Mishas. To this, he, to this he added his admiration to the director of the Moscow Jewish Theatre Granovsky, the constructivist theatres of Tairov and Merhold, and Akhmateli, the brilliant director of the Georgian Experimental Theatre. It was indeed in Kharkiv in the early 20s uh, that Shevelov was first introduced to the world of theatrical culture and began his lifelong love for the theater. He left us several enthusiastic descriptions of the leading theaters of Moscow and St. Petersburg that came to Kharkiv only on summer tours in the 20s. He characterized most of them as organs of high theatrical culture, brilliant skills, ensemble, and performance. But even then, what, she, what he saw on stage was second rate. He did not regret spending his evenings at the theater. There were also two permanent local theaters in Kharkiv. The Harky Theater of Drama, directed by Mikola Sinelnikov on Sumska Street, and the Opera Theater on Rimarska Street. The Theater of Drama had the reputation of having been one of the best provincial uh, theaters of the Russian Empire. The highest achievement of the Harky theatrical culture growing out of its soil. But in the early 20s, it produced mostly a traditional repertoire and was close to any innovative or truly original place. This represented a serious obstacle to cultivating the viewer's acceptance of more modern productions and affected to a large extent the scenic defeat of the Kharkiv stage of the avant-garde productions of the Ukrainian Brazil Theater. The Kharkiv State Opera also lacked excellence. Yet despite its mediocre productions and second-rate directors, conductors, and singers, the opera opened to him the eternal magic of, of the musical world. I quote, I may not have understood the music, but the fact of its existence gave me a different perspective. It taught me to appreciate the modern theater, which was waiting for me in the second half of the 20s. There was no experimentation on the opera stage, but the opera was a theatrical experiment in, in itself. And it was this, what Mikola Zerov called 
Eternal magic of the opera, Neobutni Char opera, that has remained with me until the present day. It is truly admirable that these experiences at a time when the artistic tradition had been deformed by the historical era, provincialism and revolution, contributed eventually to the formation of a modern, refined personality, a brilliant intellectual and scholar. Next, Yuri Shevelov traces his discovery of Ukraine to his school days in Kharkiv to a conversation in Kharkiv with Anatoly Nosev, his cousin, who was the director of the anthropological division, division of, the, of the Academy of Sciences. In a moment of useful revolt, the very young Shivilov called the Ukrainian language unattractive, necrasiva. Nosev calmly replied that a language spoken by millions of people could never be unattractive. This reflexive response by the much mm, older and respected cousin fell, according to Shevelov, or on fertile ground. It produced in him another, what he viewed as irrational shift in subconsciousness, another complex. It was like a nail driven permanently in his heart. Discovery of Ukraine continues in the university. The three school scholars who contributed most to Shevelov's intellectual growth in general were Bulakhovsky, Bilecki, and Shamrai. Bulakhovsky introduced Shevelov to the mystery of linguistics. Bilecki and Shamrai allowed him to discover the separate existence of the Ukrainian literary tradition distinct from that of the Russian. From them, he learned the simple principle of the interconnectedness of tradition and territory, of land and the written world. This principle uh, uh, he found productive during his entire life. At this time, he also discovered Taras Shevchenko and Paolo Tychina, but especially Lesa Ukrainka, who impressed him greatly as a literary figure of European stature. Of similar influence on his life, especially in the late, late uh, late 20s, was the colorful cultural life of Kharkiv. Despite its provincialism and poverty, Kharkiv represented an urban culture that was Ukrainian at its roots. The opera and theaters had a lively Ukrainian repertoire. Of great significance was the presence of the Brazil theater. Organized in Kyiv by Les Kurbas in 1922, the Brazil studio moved to Kharkiv in 1925, where until 1933, it trained an entire generation of Ukrainian actors and directors. As a director and teacher, Kurbas revolutionized the Ukrainian theater elevating it in style, aesthetics, and repertoire from the provincial to the level of a modern European theater. Shevelov saw each new production from the very first to the very last. All this carried for Shevelov the promise of limitless possibilities for Ukrainian cultural achievements. It was a wide horizon of bright expectation for Ukraine as its future. Just as he saw the greatest attainment of the human spirit in the Greek Acropolis, Japanese Mara, uh, Nara, the Indian Taj Mahal, and the Mayan Mexican ruin of Ashmal, he considered the performance of Les Kurbas production of Maclena Grassa by the Brazil Theater in October 1933 of equal greatness. Written by Mikola Kulish and performed to a half-empty theater, it was the final and perhaps most brilliant Ukrainian play of the Stalinist era, 
the swank song of Les Kurbas modern Ukrainian theater and the beginning of the brutal repressions and persecutions of everything Ukrainians. To Shivalov, the play was Les Kurbas' highest ach achievement, a testament to the Ukrainian theater, perhaps even to the entire Ukrainian nation. The anti-Ukrainian repressions in the 30s destroyed all hopes of the brighter future and rapidly de decimated an entire generation of writers and poets. Mykola Kulish was shot. Mykola Khvilovy took his own life. Les Kurbas was exiled, then killed. Shevelov's shock at this annihilative attack on Ukrainian culture gave rise to a new shift in his, uh, in his consciousness, a new commitment to the Ukrainian cause. I quote, now Ukrainians were turned into what the English-speaking people define with the world underdog. And now to retreat from that which I admired in the 20s would have been both a disgrace and a crime. Hanyba is lochin pered soboyu. Since his parents were at German origins and were raised in St. Petersburg in the context of Russian culture, Shevelov was very much aware that he could have become by inertia a Russian intellectual and a member of the ruling class. But he preferred to remain himself. He preferred to remain with the underdogs. Illogical as this seems even to him, he formulates his decisive dictum. It was then that I began to fully feel my Ukrainian identity, Ukrainianness, моя українськість, this permanent new complex carries an important political dimension. The conviction that Ukraine must become totally, I quote, independent and cleansed of everything Russian. Ukraine. He is proud of his of this choice because it is his free, unforced, unconditional choice. Я выбирав цю ідентичність. By the way, Albert Einstein once said that he was sorry to have been born a Jew because he was thus denied the opportunity and personal satisfaction of independently choosing Judaism. This shows that the opportunity of making a conscious commitment to one's identity is the most precious factor in the realization of one's potential as a human being. Nevertheless, intrigued by his choice, Shivilov continues to search for his cultural and spiritual origins. That is, those sources that made him a Ukrainian and made Kharkiv, despite its russified exterior, a Ukrainian city. He finds one of these sources in the Ukrainian heartstring of his mother's spirit. Ukrainska struna mojej matery, in tak pro se pishem. Yet the only tangible connection that Varvara Volodymyrovna um, had um, to Ukraine was that she had been born in Kharkiv, fell in love as a young girl with the legendary Ukrainian actress Maria Zankovetska and had had as the Imperial Orhans Institute in St. Petersburg a beloved teacher, a historian and Ukrainian patriot from Kharkiv, Dmitry Yavornitsky. Beyond that, there was only the fact that her sister Nadia had married a Ukrainian, the old son Anatoly became engaged to her daughter Vera and was a conscious Ukrainian. It was he who had dispelled young Shevelov's idea, idea of the unattractiveness of the Ukrainian language. That seemed to be all, but 
After 1941, Varvara Volodymyrovna moved effortlessly from speaking Russian to Ukrainian, and Shevelyov makes it a point to stress that her last already semi-conscious word, uh, word to her beloved son were in Ukrainian. He believes that she was aware of a Ukrainian heartstring in her soul, and that it why when he and his sister found their spiritual connection to Ukraine, she did not oppose it, but sympathetically supported their choice. Moreover, he feels that Ukrainianness was always present in his family. Ukrainskiy zavzdy bula v moji rodini. This is why when he speaks of his conscious solitary Ukrainian choice, he underlines the crucial role of the past. In it, he sees the presence of some sort of the mystical Ukrainian spiritual gen, duhovny gen, the same gen, uh, gen that is at the root of Kharkiv where he and his mother were born. For Shevelov then, Ukraine is a problem of his being and existence, intrinsically connected to his beloved irrational Ukrainian Kharkiv. The city discloses to him its Ukrainian essence in the pulsating life of its peasant markets and bazaars, in the tragic li literary discussion of 1925-1928, and debates about the future of Ukrainian culture, even by its city park, which imitated the natural growth of Slobozhanshina. Germans have, I quote, Germans have the world sign existence, he says, but also the understandable existential concept Dasein, an awareness of being at a particular time and place, to which he adds, being loved, being with that to which one belongs, buti svoyim в Україні і в Харкові. Ukraine is his very own with her landscape, people and small white houses. Politically not, but psychologically and subconsciously, Kharkiv to him is Ukrainian. As a scholar, Shevelov was deeply aware that the essence of things is not always visible. This idea became the categorical imperative of his scientific and critical thinking. It forced him to scrutinize the obvious, to study each subject as if no one had ever done it before, to solve riddles and to clarify that which is hidden and yet undisclosed. This, this methodological denominator is applied to all of his studies, literary, cultural, and linguistic. He searches for the origins of his being just as he searches for the embryonic stages in the history of the Ukrainian language. At the same time, this process, which is both existential and moral, allows him to clarify to himself the hidden essence of his being. In other words, themes of Kharkiv, Ukraine, and Ukrainian culture affect him unremittingly, precisely because they are the subjects of his own existence. They force him to examine and re-examine his thoughts and reflections by rediscovering himself over and over again in Ukrainian history, politics, literary, and art. Kharkiv modulates conceptually, conceptually the text of his memoirs. It is present throughout the narration. Directly or indirectly, it is the subject of dozens of his scholarly articles and after 1990, travelogues to Ukraine. Besides active support of, to Kharkiv and its cultural centers, Shevelov 
instrumental um, Shevelov was instrumental in the creation of the Friends of Kharkiv NGO. He conducted in more recent years an extensive correspondence with Kharkivites. The Shevelov archival collection at Columbia University contains his voluminous correspondence with numerous of his new and former colleagues. Some of these letters, for example, with Aksenev and Yurchenko, contain important information that reconstructs the life of the Kharkiv Institute of Education in the 20s. Very interesting and rich in material on Kharkiv is also the correspondence with Anatoly Ivchenko. Ivchenko revived the Kharkiv Historical Philological Society, where Potebnya, Sumtso, Bahali, and Yavornitsky had once worked. Among these many other correspondents was uh, Andriy Danilenko, then lecturer at the Kharkiv Pedagogical Institute, later one of the translators of Shevelov's A Historical Phonology of the Ukrainian Language, and currently professor of Russian and Slavic linguistics at Pace University. Andriy Danilenko inspired and was the co-author of the most complete to date bibliography of Shevelov's works published in 1998, and edited a German first shrift to Shevelov, published to, uh, 2012. Shevelov's immense, immense scholarly and civic activities demonstrate his incisive effort to preserve and to deepen the memory and understanding of Kharkiv's past and present. But I don't agree with those scholars who speak of him simply as a Kharkiv patriot. I am inclined to see in Shevelov a sine qua non need to reveal and overcome the existential tension that is part of his Ukrainian self-identification, self his being and his existence. When he returned to Ukraine, he prefers to visit Kharkiv, extending the traditionally mapped axis of Kyiv to Lviv, Kyiv, Kharkiv. Kharkiv is for him a metonym of Ukraine in its history and contemporary situation. Shevelov understood fully the traumas and losses that periodically swept away the um, best of Ukrainian cultural achievements and decimated Ukraine's brightest men and women. He predicted new threats from Russia unless Ukraine accepted itself and set out to fulfill its colossal modern potential of what he called unity in variety. Ukraine had to realize itself as a modern and united nation. There was no conflict in his mind between Ukraine's east and west. Symbolically, Kharkiv, once the, the capital of Ukraine, was its heart. Ukraine to him was indivisible, just as his being was indiv indivisible from Kharkiv and from Ukraine. Shevelov's desire to understand the mystery of the hidden forces of uh, the human spirit and of the Ukrainian nation in particular, as well as the mystery of his own unqualified belongingness to Ukrainian culture and nation as a result of these forces, remained with him for the rest of his life. This is what made him an unparalleled human being, a seeker and a believer, a Ukrainian intellectual, a scholar, and a man of the world. Thank you. I have to admit, or make a disclaimer that Chevalier for me is something very personal, if only because for, for a number of reasons. Number one is that uh, his presence is very much felt here at Columbia, uh, where I teach. I feel it. It obliges me to do things uh, that I feel are continuation of what he has been doing here as somebody who elevated Ukrainian uh, to the level that I can't even begin to hope to sustain it there. Uh, also because, physically speaking, Shevelyov 
uh, used to live in the street where I live, and I feel that present uh, in a kind of a personal way. But most importantly is the fact that what Shevelyov has to say, and I admit that I love reading him, is painfully pertinent to what is going on in Ukraine. To what is going on in Ukraine conceived not simply in geographical sense of the word, but as a continent, as a civilization, as something that has so many dimensions that Ukraine in uh, the narrowly conceived sense of the word uh, that my generation was brought up to internalize had no place for. And I mean Ukraine that includes not only Ukrainians living now where there is war being waged against them for the mere choice of being free and run their own lives, but also Ukrainians who live outside of the geographical borders of that country and nevertheless feel to be an inseparable part of that country and of that civilization and not only passively feel that but actively contributing to the culture that I am not, I don't hesitate to call one of the few truly world cultures. The cultures that only today starts realizing the dimensions that have been, for a number of historic reasons, forgotten, ignored, remained ungalvanized. And uh, Shevelyov is one such endlessly, endlessly interesting, invigorating dimension of that world Ukrainian culture that we still need truly to discover, rethink, reappropriate, and make include into what hopefully will become a modern, vibrant, new Ukrainian identity. Going back to Shevelyov, and I'm not going to be very consistent or uh, perhaps logical, bear with me, but I said that Shevelyov reverberates with what's going on now in Ukraine. And what I meant by that is not only the fact that we are now witnessing the military intervention of Russia against Ukraine, the grabbing of Ukrainian territories, the killing of Ukrainians, but we are also witnessing the intensification of what Shevelyov has written so much, so perceptively, so insightfully about, and by that I mean Ukrainian-Russian cultural war. In his text, Moskva uh, Marasejka, he famously writes, and I quote, the history of the cultural ties between Ukraine and Russia is the history of a great and yet unfinished war. Russian imperial thinking has always denied the very existence of Ukrainian language and culture. What the Russian imperial minister famously said of the Ukrainian language sums up the Russian version of the Ukrainian civilization as such. There never was, there is no, there can never be a Ukrainian language. Add Ukrainians as civilization. Not too much of a stretch in my opinion. This denial in fact meant questioning the very humanity of Ukrainians. The logical arrival point of such a denial is the dehumanization of the entire nation and its annihilation, first symbolic and then physical. Chevalier witnessed the, logical the logic implemented in the late 
1920s and in the early 1930s. Artificial mass famine organized by the Kremlin in Ukraine was preceded and also accompanied by a massive assault against the Ukrainian language and culture, by the dehumanization of the principal carrier of the Ukrainian identity, the independent peasant, who is presented in, so uh, in Soviet propaganda of that period in literature, film, the press, as a vermin, blood-sucking kulak. This is followed by the murder of millions of Ukrainians in the Holodomor of 1932-1933. Elements of this narrative are blood curdingly present in current narrative. The attack on the Ukrainian culture that never relented, in fact. The dehumanization of Ukrainians now, not as kulaks, though, but as banderites, and on and on. I'm not going to enumerate all the epithets. Writing the history of the Ukrainian language in the first half of the 20th century, Shevelyov notes that Russification, and Russification is the main trajectory of the Russian assault on Ukrainian civilization. Russification took the form of the outside pressure exerted by the Russian imperial regime on Ukrainian language. Basically, it consisted in prohibition of the use of the language in education, book printing, science, technology, politics, other strategic spheres of communication spheres fraught with the possibility of political mobilization of a colonized against the colonizer. The Soviets, note Shevelyov, came up with their own original form of assimilationist strategy, something that never occurred to the British, French, or Spanish imperialists. The Bolsheviks interfered in the very system of the Ukrainian language, changing its vocabulary, grammar, syntax, stylistics, even pronunciation, to make it more like Russian. This amounted to maiming of the language. And that maiming was so massive and resulted in making Sovietized Ukrainian sound all too often like crippled, inferior, pale version of Russian, unattractive for younger generation. The young generation prefer the original than pale replicas of anything, I posit. The not quite a people were allowed to speak not quite a language to what Soviet Ukrainian often had been reduced. The collapse of the Soviet empire did not reverse these assimilationist processes, contrary to what many would expect. Russification, in fact, intensified and took new, more effective forms. There's no end in sight to the cultural war. There is no open ban on the use of Ukrainian in the political sphere in modern Ukraine, yet millions are effectively denied the right to speak it because of the atmosphere of intolerance. Respondents in Kyiv, Kharkiv, Donetsk, Crimea, Odessa, to say nothing of uh, Crimea, and many other parts of the country consistently report that they feel, quote, uncomfortable speaking Ukrainian in public. There are hundreds of court cases over discrimination at work against speakers of Ukrainian throughout Ukraine. I myself was given two volumes documenting, documenting such complaints in the courts. The russificatory changes imposed on literary standard of Ukrainian language have been allowed to stand since independence. The old Soviet orthography is still in place, mostly. New post-Soviet generation grow up using the language norms that often contradict the very spirit of Ukrainian 
concocted by Stalin's linguistic henchmen. Chevalot places a particular emphasis on the role of jargon, slang, and colloquial vocabulary for language as a whole. In uh, his article uh, writing on the, on the Ukrainian linguist and uh, researcher of slang and jargon, uh, Horbal, uh, he says that that layer of vocabulary serves as a kind of a laboratory for experimentation, for innovations, for generating what is new blood for any language. The moment the language loses its jargon, its slang, its colloquial layer, it becomes doomed to eventual extinction. Now, Ukrainian today, in fact, does not have its own slang, comparable to English, to Polish, or to Russian. A number of the dictionaries of Ukrainian slang published, even at cursory inspection, reveal that, and I didn't expect them cursory, I, uh, cursorily, uh, I inspected them uh, at, in great detail. And between 75 and 85 percent of their entire body are Russian borrowings, lifted from Russian and often even not properly assimilated phonetically or in other way. What does it tell us? If we keep Shevelyov's analysis of the vocabulary of a living language, whereby one of the most important mechanisms of, of word production is the semantic derivation, when the word uses its own resources and then derives new meanings from them. Ukrainian now seems to be using this kind of mechanism increasingly more rarely, if at all. Uh, this reinfor uh, reinforces the colonial dependence of Ukrainian on uh, 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 sorry, I just uh, skipped one thing. Ukrainian language, in fact, does not have its own slang comparable to English, Polish, and Russian. It is not allowed, and this is not because Ukrainians are not creative. Uh, my explanation of this strange phenomenon is because Ukrainians are not allowed to develop their own slang because there is a, what we see in Ukraine today, the, the biggest obstacle to such a creativity is the consistent mixing of Ukrainian and Russian in the communicative spheres that are most formative for identity today. I mean television, cinema, press, popular entertainment, and music. What we see is two anchors on a popular television program. One speaks Ukrainian, another speaks Russian. The listener is divided between two languages, listening to both of them. And the result is that Ukrainian becomes psychologically paired with Russian to such an extent that it simply repeats Russian everywhere you take it after that. And what we see now is this pairing of Ukrainian with Russian, effectively, it shuts down the mechanisms of language innovation in Ukrainian. It dooms the former to slavish mimicking of Russian, not only in colloquial speech, but most importantly in terminology. It reinforces the colonial dependence of Ukrainian and Russian, not only for neologisms, but for the language view of the world itself. The dependence proves so great today that even having open channels of communication with the rest of the world Ukrainian-speaking community borrows most English neologisms not directly from the original source, English, but via Russian. Very often with typically Russian twists to those borrowings. This is just one of many signs pointing to the quick decline of Ukrainian language in qualitative and quantitative terms. It has been the tendency over the years of independence. 
Ukrainians seem to be losing the cultural war with the empire. They have not been able to, able or allowed to develop a vision of a nation or national revival that would unite all citizens of the country. In his seminal text, Moscow, Marosei, Kasevilov cites historical precedents when a nation defeated militarily survives and even flourishes again thanks to the strength of its culture. This happened to ancient Greece, conquered by Rome, which appropriated Greek culture and set stage set the stage for the second revival of Greece in Byzantium. This happened to Rome, in turn, who succumbed to the Vandals, only to return in Italian, French, Spanish, and other European cultures and languages. This is the cue that Ukrainians, who are now fighting off Russian aggression, should take from Yuri Shevelyov. Shevelyov knew that Ukraine can hardly hope to compete with Russian empire militarily. But he was sure that Ukraine can compete and win in the cultural war with it. It seems that Ukrainian society has focused exclusively on the military aspect of the Russian-Ukrainian war and is about to capitulate in the cultural war. The war that Ukraine stands a good chance of winning, by the way. It seems that even Ukrainian-speaking Ukrainians are prepared to give up on their language, one single most important aspect of their modern identity, of their political nationhood. In his other article, whose title resonates directly with this conference, the fourth Kharkiv, Chevalier wrote in 1948, I quote, one cannot do battle without having a battlefield. The battlefield with the Soviet regime can only be thinking in categories of nation, end of quote. And then, late, just uh, below that, he writes, only from the national positions can Ukrainian, Ukrainians fight the Moscow occupation regime. Ukrainians need to define that battlefield with their empire if they want to take that another very important cue from Shevelyov. They need to stop responding to the empire on empire's own terms. They need to stop apologizing and telling that we are not this and we are not that, that we are not Banderites, that we don't hate Russians, that we are ready even to speak Russian in Lviv, unreciprocated gesture, unfortunately. They finally need to define their own battlefield in terms of who they are as a nation. What keeps them together? What has kept them together all these years, despite all the prophecies of uh, chasms and uh, divisions and internal wars, until the open Russian aggression against this? And this is my take on a tiny part of Yuri Shevelyov's message. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sevchuk. Uh, our final speaker today will be uh, Michael Moser, who is professor of Slavic linguistics and philology at the University of Vienna. Ukrainian Free University at Munich, and the Pazmani Petr Catholic University at Budapest. He's also president of MAO, the International Association of Ukrainianists. Uh, the title of Professor Moser's talk is a little bit different uh, than in the program. Uh, the title is now George Shevelyov's Personal History of the Ukrainian Language in the First Half of the 20th Century. So please welcome uh, Professor Moser. Thank you so much, Mark. Uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, it's not the first time that I'm here at Columbia, but uh, this time it's a special pleasure and honor uh, because uh, here we are honoring a person 
who um, has been very important uh, in my scholarly career. Uh, Yuri Shevelyov is definitely uh, one of the most important scholarly authorities uh, I've encountered. Um, and uh, he is still having great impact on my work. Uh, also, please uh, let me apologize for my voice, which is not as strong as usually. The secret is that I'm just recovering from a flu, uh, but I will try to uh, speak uh, in a way that you understand. Anyway, is it okay with the microphone? Good. Okay. So uh, this is the fourth talk, and it's again a little bit different, but um, some things will be repeated here. Why did I change the topic? And my apologies for that. Uh, I think that the original uh, title wouldn't have given me the opportunity uh, to offer you uh, something new. Uh, George Evelyov is such an authority that uh, he has been appraised so often uh, that uh, I could have really only repeated what others uh, probably said better uh, before. So uh, I thought that uh, this take would be maybe appropriate for tonight. Um, I slightly changed one of uh, the mo titles of uh, Shvilyov's most important books. Um, and uh, my uh, plan was and still is to get a, an idea of uh, uh, Shevlyov's linguistic biography, so to speak. Uh, and this is what I would like to present to you uh, tonight briefly. Um, time is proceeding. And um, I'm repeating myself right from the beginning because you saw this photograph before in the second uh, presentation. This is Shevlyov. Uh, at the period of time that is of most interest uh, to us now. So why is Shilyov so important uh, for uh, somebody who uh, is interested in Slavic linguistics and particularly in Ukrainian linguistics? Shilyov said about himself, and he is not a, a person who uh, liked boasting, as far as I see, but he said about himself, те, що Грушевський зробив для української історії, я зробив для української мови. What Грушевський did for Ukrainian history, I did for the Ukrainian language. Uh, how could we translate this? Uh, Shevlyov was the person who most convincingly uh, demonstrated that Ukrainian um, doesn't have to be viewed only uh, from within uh, Russian context uh, and uh, doesn't have to be viewed in this context at all, that Ukrainian is uh, something that stands for itself and even historically. And this view uh, was suggested, had been suggested even prior to Shevelyov, but Shevelyov probably um, was the person who gave the most convincing proof of this, uh, particularly in his Opus Magnum, a historical phonology of the Ukrainian language of 1979, a large book um, that is of uh, outstanding value. Uh, in another Opus Magnum, a prehistory of Slavic of 1964, uh, Shulyov had already, I would say, prepared the ground for uh, the historical phonology of the Ukrainian language also a really great book uh, that is, by the way, um, accessible on the internet. Uh, Shevelyov uh, still is a leading authority in probably all spheres of the uh, study of the Ukrainian language, uh, beginning uh, from phonology, extending uh, to uh, syntax stylistics, the study of the history of the Ukrainian literary language. Uh, he is uh, really the leading authority uh, in Ukrainian linguistics. Uh, he still is. Uh, but, and 
I think that this is um, a major issue uh, if we try to um, evaluate uh, Chevalier's merits, uh, even from the modest view of uh, a Slavic linguist, we should always uh, take into account that Chevalier was not only a linguist. Uh, his uh, profile was much broader. He um, offered an important voice in the field of Ukrainian literary criticism and Ukrainian cultural history. And uh, it's not only um, two different spheres, so to speak. Uh, Ukraine, uh, Shevlyov is an erudite scholar, and Shevlyov is a leading intellectual with this broader profile. Uh, these profiles are always in some kind of interesting interplay. And it uh, depends on what Shevlyov uh, actually wrote to which extent, to what extent you would feel it. But I think that uh, this is especially feelable in um, uh, the collection of essays, uh, the collections of essays, and thesis and the pieces of 1971 to a certain extent, but uh, to a very large extent in uh, um, younger um, collection of essays called In and Around Key, of which I strongly recommend uh, it uh, still impresses me very much. And also, I would say that this broad profile um, is um, to a very large extent feelable in uh, the uh, monograph uh, that inspired me to uh, change the title of this talk, The Ukrainian Language in the First Half of the 20th Century of 1989. Uh, that is not only, I would say, uh, uh, an excellent um, monograph devoted to the topic, but that uh, gives general proof that the study of standard languages, uh, be it Ukrainian or uh, any other Slavic or non-Slavic language should always be embedded in a broader context, not only uh, a linguistic context, but that uh, other factors, uh, sociological, historical, political factors, have to be uh, taken into account. Otherwise, a history of a standard language in the modern sense of the word uh, cannot be uh, satisfactory. So my major source is um, the book that has been mentioned before uh, tonight, that is uh, Shevardyov's Memoirs, and it's only the first part of these memoirs. Um, generally, I'm just listening to Shevardyov, so to speak. What does he tell us? And um, our colleagues uh, did so too. My focus is just on um, observations and statements regarding languages and particularly uh, the Ukrainian language. You heard that before, but here um, I would like to put the focus on the fact that uh, George Chevalier uh, was originally officially uh, Georgi Vladimirovich Schneider. So uh, you heard that before, and many of you, most of you know, uh, Shevlyov simply was not an ethnic Ukrainian. Uh, and uh, he was born as the son of Vladimir Schneider and Varvara Meder, as you heard before, both of them of German ancestry. And uh, the family language was Russian. More than that, uh, Shivlyev's father um, was an officer of the Russian Imperial Army. Uh, he, uh, during World War I, requested the, the Tsar to Russify his name. And uh, during his service as a general major of the Russian Imperial Army, he was one of the most active Russifiers, so to speak. He uh, 
reportedly ordered his subordinates to speak and write in Russian only, and this was his personal initiative, and uh, demanded that their relatives reply in Russian only too. Uh, be it as it may, one of the consequences, uh, as I see it, could be uh, the fact that uh, Shevlyov could have um, understood at quite an early stage of his <coughs> lifetime what uh, we now maybe understand better than many did decades ago, that national identity is, uh, to a large degree, a matter of individual choice, not only a matter of blood relations, right? Uh, but this individual choice is not completely arbitrary, and it has to do something with dignity and uh, convictions, because during the Second World War, uh, Shevardyov could have escaped many hardships if he had chosen the way of others, including his relatives, if he had declared himself a Volksdeutscher, that is, as a person belonging to the ethnic German group in Ukraine, he could have done so, but he didn't. Why? Because he was not willing to, as he put it, change his skin and soul. So this choice of national identity is, once again, not entirely arbitrary. As for Shevlyov's mother, uh, she uh, began speaking Ukrainian only in 1941, as Shevlyov tells us, and uh, she surprised him, although he uh, mentions that she talked Ukrainian time and again after 1941. He uh, surprised him, she surprised him when he addressed her last words to him uh, in Ukrainian. Shulyov then offers an explanation of uh, this Ukrainianness that uh, could have been part of his family uh, although it was not uh, based on blood relations, and he refers to some mystical, telluric powers of the Ukrainian soilers. Uh, he literally puts it, that gives birth to Ukrainianness even in the darkest epochs. Um, that is one thing, and here uh, Shevardyov, um, puzzles us a little bit because um, on the one hand, uh, he refers to these uh, mystical powers. On the other hand, uh, he uh, concedes um, time and again in his memoirs that uh, as for himself, um, his way to Ukrainianness was uh, to some extent uh, anyway, um, a matter of a mere coincidence. Maybe not mere coincidence, but some things were quite coincidental. Uh, coincidental um, external factors strongly supported his path to Ukrainianness. Um, the family language was Russian. Um, along with Russian, um, French turned out to become one of the family languages, although uh, on a completely different level because his mother knew French very well, and uh, when uh, he was in gymnasium, his mother um, introduced one day a week uh, when she and her son would speak French. Moreover, uh, Chevalier learned uh, during his uh, gymnasium years uh, some German in private lessons and a little bit of Latin only one year uh, before the Bolsheviks uh, destroyed the traditional school system. Where is Ukrainian? Uh, Ukrainian is not on the list yet. Uh, at some point in his memoirs, uh, Shevlyov, tells, uh, Shevlyov tells us the story that we uh, have heard before, and I want to uh, tell it again because I think it's a nice and interesting story 
originally, Shivliov admits in his uh, very sincere, very frank memoirs, as I would say, that's why they are so interesting, that he uh, too originally re regarded the coexistence of Ukrainian and Russian as a merely social phenomenon. And he uh, hesitated to uh, accept Ukrainian as a language in its own rights at all. That's, of course, the traditional Russian imperial context, as we uh, heard before. Uh, at the age of seven to nine, uh, he uh, got in contact with uh, the Ukrainian sphere, and he uh, puts it like that. This was his first direct and continuing contact with the Ukrainian contact with the Ukrainian sphere, um, and that was in the rural context. And uh, these stays in the countryside uh, strongly confirmed his view that Ukrainian was a mere peasant idiom. And even more so, during the first, uh, during the uh, temporary period of Ukrainian um, independence after the First World War, even the teaching materials uh, that uh, entered uh, the school where Shivlyov was uh, taught. And uh, the teachers themselves tended to confirm this view and to um, enforce this prejudice. Shulyov uh, says about himself that he uh, did not have a hostile attitude toward the Ukrainian language, but uh, it is clear that he was um, a victim of these stereotypes to a very large degree. Uh, at some point, he tells the story of uh, the director of his gymnasium, who um, turned out to be uh, the most important teacher of Ukrainian at the gymnasium. And Shulyov uh, frankly concedes in his memoirs that he just couldn't believe it. Uh, because up to then, he had only observed that new arrivals or people from the countryside would speak Ukrainian, but uh, not somebody as authoritative, as recognized as a director of a gymnasium. Uh, this puzzled Shivalyov, but it, uh, it did not uh, yet mean a significant change. The real change occurred, and Shivalyov uh, literally calls it the change from Saul to Paul, and as we heard before, the discovery of Ukraine. The real change occurred when his cousin, Anatoly Nosiu, um, who um, was Shivlyov, uh, who was the fiancé of uh, Shivlyov's sister, um, had a discussion with Shivlyov about Mikhail Ruszewski's illustrated history of Ukraine. So here is an immediate link between Shivlyov and Ruszewski, so to speak. Um, Shulyov, during this conversation, said to Nasiu, okay, Ukrainian as language might exist, but it is not beautiful, as we heard, yes? And uh, this was, of course, meant as a provocation, but um, Nasiu um, surprised Shulyov when he answered very calmly, a language spoken by millions of people cannot be not beautiful. And these words triggered a revolution in Shivlyov's mind. And at that point, Shivlyov really changed from Saul to Paul, so to speak. And how did he start? Again, he started with Ruszewski, with uh, Ruszewski's Illustrated History of Ukraine, which he read, and it cost him some effort to do that. 
And then he uh, continued by translating a brief essay uh, authored by Edgar Allan Poe from Russian into Ukrainian. Uh, and that was his first baptism, so to speak, into Ukrainianness. So Shevlyov was um, briefly not a native speaker of Ukrainian. And in my view, uh, one might uh, consider that this might uh, have had some um, consequences that one could think of um, if one tries to evaluate uh, Shevlyov as a speaker of Ukrainian and as uh, somebody uh, who did so much for the study of the Ukrainian language. Um, the fact that he was not a native speaker of uh, Ukrainian um, might have meant that uh, Shulyov could have had a raised awareness of the fact that the modern Ukrainian standard language, as any other modern standard language, was not and is not a natural given. Even more so, Shevlyov grew up with the Ukrainian language, so to speak, as a modern standard language, uh, precisely at the moment when uh, the modern Ukrainian standard language as such was being forged. Uh, and uh, again, every modern standard language is forged. And Shevlyov was uh, um, somebody who witnessed this very clearly, and he uh, understood this um, from the very first moment. Uh, he heard some Ukrainian uh, in the countryside. Uh, he had heard some Ukrainian in the countryside before. But when he uh, read Rushevsky's Illustrated History of Ukraine, that was not easy for him to understand. He definitely must have had some a passive knowledge of Ukrainian. And that is how he remembered this moment in his memoirs decades later. Um, and when he translated Poe, he desperately felt the need for good dictionaries uh, that were just not extant at that point. Um, and uh, so he was in a situation when he maybe uh, understood even better than others that codification, this uh, standardization of languages, costs an effort and uh, is not just, so to speak, uh, the use of a language, but working on a language. And here I would like to add that uh, even during this first half of the uh, 20th century, Shevlyov himself took part in uh, some projects that were devoted to the codification of the Ukrainian language. And that occurred under uh, German occupation. Um, um, he was part of some teams. Um, and uh, we could talk more about that, but maybe not now. Uh, what also uh, distinguishes Shevlyov from native speakers of Ukrainian uh, from that period is the fact that native speakers of Ukrainian at that time uh, could not really have known the Ukrainian standard language from the beginning because the standard language as such had not been fully established. They usually arrived um, at schools, at universities, with their native knowledge of varieties of Ukrainian that were based on um, local dialects and were most often characterized by quite a few Russian elements. Um, and uh, nowadays, as you know, we know um, these varieties, we uh, label these varieties that still exist as Surjik. And in this regard, uh, Shevlyov is one of our major sources because I'm not mistaken, if I'm not mistaken, um, I studied that at a certain 
uh, point, uh, Shivlyov uh, is the one who gives us um, proof of the first moment or the first period of time when this uh, term surgic in the contemporary meaning uh, was used at all because Shivlyov was already um, uh, quite well known, quite experienced, young but quite experienced uh, specialist for the Ukrainian language in the early 1930s and it was at that time when he heard the expression surgic for the first time one of his students uh, said that uh, the variety spoken in the Kharkiv area um, were surgic varieties. Uh, Shulyov got in interested in these varieties and he got interested in preserving the culture of the Ukrainian standard language at a quite early stage when he um, published uh, some articles in students' newspapers on surgic phenomena. Uh, by the way, he criticized his professor um, and um, that is one early proof of uh, Shevlyov's interest in linguistics, so to speak. Uh, also, um, Shevlyov's norms, one could argue, were uh, based on the most authoritative norms from the outset. I will not go into details here, but uh, it was probably one of his privileges that uh, he was born in Kharkiv because uh, of course, there were other norms of Ukrainian. Um, there existed other norms of Ukrainian at the time, but the Kharkiv norms were the most uh, recognized ones. So uh, Shivlyov um, did not have to um, adapt to other norms in um, contexts where one variety of Ukrainian would um, meet the other one. Um, another quite obvious fact for us today, but uh, probably this was not so obvious, um, or certainly it was not so obvious and not so well known at uh, the period of time we are talking about. Shevlyov was, of course, as a non Ukrainian. Uh, very aware of the fact that Ukrainian is not only the language of or for ethnic Ukrainians. And so Shevlyov uh, repeatedly mentions uh, ethnic Russians, uh, Jews, and Poles uh, who spoke Ukrainian and who uh, quite often were uh, dedicated Ukrainian patriots. Uh, I couldn't refrain from citing an NKVD officer anyway in this, in this respect. Uh, Shivlyov was interrogated by an NKVD uh, officer in 1941, as you know, and he asked uh, Shivlyov about uh, elements of Ukrainian nationalism um, that uh, could have been uh, characteristic of uh, Shivlyov's teachers. Uh, we heard their names, uh, Bulakhovsky, Bilatsky, uh, and so on and so forth. And uh, Shivlyov said, you know, they are not even Ukrainians. And the NKVD officer uh, replied, one can be non-Ukrainian and a Ukrainian nationalist. So this was widespread knowledge anyway. Um, if you um, allow yourself this close reading of um, Shulyov's memoirs, you will uh, probably um, come to the same conclusion as I do, that Shulyov uh, really um, experienced it as a genuine pleasure uh, that he uh, was um, accepted and acknowledged as a member of the Ukrainian uh, community and the Ukrainian speaking community. Uh, this meant a lot for him, uh, and um, this was a very emotional uh, 
affair for him. So um, the view was a very important um, city for him in many respects, as was Kharkiv, by the way. But uh, one of the most important aspects of Lviv um, was its Ukrainian-speaking character, of course. So that Shulyov says about himself in his memoirs that his genuine honeymoon uh, did not occur with any woman or other person, but with the city, the city of Lviv. This was a very emotional thing. Once you switch languages, uh, you uh, automatically uh, are in a multilingual context. Uh, I will not speak about uh, Lviv uh, during the Second World War now, uh, because uh, time is elapsing. Uh, but what I would uh, like to focus on briefly, also because it gives us um, a short opportunity to return to uh, today's sad events, is that Shivlyov really um, valued ethnic and linguistic diversity. And in his memoirs, uh, he particularly mentions uh, the Crimea and um, he um, tells us that he visited the Crimea uh, repeatedly. Uh, he um, uh, tended to be sick. Uh, he was, he, 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 his health was not very strong, so uh, he often had the opportunity to, to, to go to spas. And uh, while referring to the Crimea, he uh, mentions the Crimean Tatars and said that uh, aside with the Russian arrivals, uh, the Crimean Tatars uh, really meant a great appeal to him. And uh, he uh, regarded it as, a, it as a true pleasure um, to look at a different world and listen to an incomprehensible language. Uh, this is, of course, something that uh, not only linguists might enjoy, but most importantly, um, Shivlyov, as a person who comes from a Russian-speaking background, um, clearly sees that uh, the Crimean Tatars are a very important factor for uh, the multilingual and uh, diverse character of the Crimea. Ukrainianization is what takes place in the Soviet Union in the 1920s, in um, the early 1930s. One could speak a lot about that. Um, I will uh, focus only on some few moments. Um, of course, in the long run, uh, it was very important for Shevlyov, not only that uh, the Ukrainian language as such existed, and, it, and that it was a beautiful language anyway, uh, it was also um, paramount that this language was linked with an attractive culture, with an attractive intellectual culture. And uh, Ukrainianization uh, meant a lot in that regard. We heard a lot about that before, so I will not repeat myself now. But uh, Brazil uh, is, of course, a key issue uh, in this um, context. Also, intellectual leaders are always important um, in terms of Many things, including the consolidation of an identity. Let's put it like that. Uh, Shulyov tells us that, again, with his um, um, cousin, Anatoly Nosiu, he uh, spent some time in Kyiv, and that he briefly attended um, a session of the Ukrainian Academy of Sciences and Arts in Kyiv. 
And um, he frankly says that he was not particularly uh, impressed by Sergei Efremov and Mikhail Khrushchevsky as they presented during this session, but with the distance of a few decades, uh, Shevelyov later remembered that anyway, this event, this meeting probably meant his second act, the second act of his uh, baptism into Ukrainianness. Ukrainian Ukrainianization was important, uh, but uh, Shulyov tells us uh, much more about Ukrainianization than uh, one would read in many studies. So he tells us quite uh, interesting things about the grotesque aspects of Ukrainianization, um, about uh, language exams that uh, people who did not know uh, Ukrainian uh, would pass, whereas he himself would not pass, although he knew Ukrainian quite well. Uh, he tells us about uh, documents that were um, regarded as Ukrainian language documents, although only the title was Ukrainian, and so on and so forth. Um, with Shevryov, the way led from the Ukrainian language to a Ukrainian national identity. At the moment when uh, Shevlyov um, began learning Ukrainian and um, increasingly adopting Ukrainian as maybe his most important language, uh, he still regarded himself as a person of two cultures. And as we heard before, um, this ultimate step toward a Ukrainian identity, not a twofold identity, but uh, toward a Ukrainian identity, uh, occurred only at the time when the Stalinists began persecuting the Ukrainian language and Ukrainian culture with utmost fervor and more openly, much more openly than before. Um, and this is what he said. We heard that, or similar words before. At that point, Shulyov uh, identified with Ukrainian culture. Um, for several reasons, also because he felt himself that uh, as the son of an officer of the Russian Imperial Army, he was a potential victim of Bolshevik uh, persecutions from the very beginning. This was one aspect. And on the other hand, at that point in the 1930s, Shulyov realized that he had simply already invested too much into this Ukrainian culture to embark on, a, on its destruction, to uh, take part in its destruction. That's one side of the story. The other side of the story is that we might forget that not only uh, Shivlyov was um, personal witness to some major events of this Stalinist terror against Ukrainian culture and um, the Ukrainian language. To a certain extent, um, he was even much closer than one would have thought. And I'm not talking about the two sessions of the show trial against the U Union for the Liberation of Ukraine, where uh, Shulyov just happened to sit I'm talking about the fact that his immediate colleagues were major uh, perpetrators against the Ukrainian language with their publications against nationalist, oops, nationalist deviations uh, of the Ukrainian language and so on and so forth. M even more so, uh, Shivlyov uh, at some point uh, 
was forced to collaborate uh, with the major um, perpetrator against the Ukrainian language of those times, Naum Kahanovich. Uh, he willy-nilly did so, but he had to work on a textbook of the Ukrainian language in Kahanovich's apartment in Kyiv for several weeks. Shevlyov came to an understanding of what was going on um, only gradually. So he tells us that he himself was not yet particularly interested in uh, the Kharkiv conference, in the orthog orthography conference of 1927, but at a time when the results of the Kharkiv uh, conference were perverted in 1933, he already understood what was going on. Uh, he was baffled, and he understood that the Bolsheviks uh, had now decided to make as he put it, a toy of the Ukrainian language, and that the NKVD was having a watchful eye on its norms. Shivlyov was, if we talk about his history of the Ukrainian language and about his linguistic biography, he was always exposed to the language of propaganda, so to speak, and he openly admits in his memoirs that he himself, of course, he had no other choice, basically followed the rules of Bolshevik phraseology and terminology, both as a teacher and as an author. Um, he was even the one who searched for Lenin quotations for his teacher, Bulakovsky, and so on and so forth. So he knew the rules of the game. But we heard about this. Uh, disgusting story about uh, the plague in Kharkiv and about the allegations that were put forward against Chevlyov recently. Uh, and uh, we can now say, as you know, that none of these obligations were justified. Everything is on the table. Uh, it was published recently, what Chevlyov uh, wrote under German occupation. Um, and so what Chevlyov mentions in his memoirs is even more credible. Yes, Chevlyov wrote this and that under Nazi occupation, but it is OK. And when the Nazis, according to their new propagandistic rules, demanded that he should not write or the authors to these journals should not write about the Bolshevik regime, but about the Jewish Bolshevik regime, uh, Shevlyov simply refused to collaborate. So you see how absurd these accusations really are. So my last point here is that not only uh, was Shevlyov not born as a Ukrainian and uh, not born as a speaker of Ukrainian, not surprisingly, Shevlyov was not born as a linguist either. But that's, of course, a joke. Uh, he, <laughs> he, he became a linguist uh, even later than most others. Let's put it like that. Um, I will not. Uh, torture you now with a detailed uh, account of uh, his path toward Ukrainian linguistics, but even his dissertation was still at the boundary of linguistics and literary studies, and he went for linguistics primarily because uh, he felt at that point, despite uh, the circumstances that I mentioned before, that uh, uh, linguistics was a bit less politicized than literary studies back then. Uh, he writes about his way toward linguistics afterwards, and he um, here even offers uh, an image of linguistics that uh, is quite surprisingly narrow, I would say, uh, although he is such a broad personality, uh, and his uh, true contribution to 
Ukrainian linguistics and Slavic linguistics in general is uh, as broad uh, as I mentioned. Um, but still, as for this first half of the 20th century, Shemlyov had already done this and that for Ukrainian linguistics. It was not the period when he wrote his most important works, although he uh, already prepared some of them. For instance, his study on um, the traditions of Galicia. For instance, his uh, studies on syntax, he did this and that, but uh, during the Second World War, due to many, many factors, including a biography characterized by many, many hardships under the Bolsheviks, under the Nazis, uh, at that point, Shivlyov was not yet Shivlyov, the great, great authority, so to speak. Still, this is what we think today. What really happened in Lviv during the Second World War is that uh, he, while uh, realizing that he himself was not yet uh, mature, that he was still in desperate need of good teachers, realized that uh, young scholars would come to see him and to look at him with bright eyes, with admiration, and Shulyov mentions two of them. One of them is Oleksa Horbach, whose name we heard before. And the other one is Havrelo Shilo, who is less known, but who uh, is an important uh, student of uh, Ukrainian dialects. So even at that point, Shulyov had become a true idol uh, of uh, future scholars of Ukrainian studies anyway. Um, he is so nowadays, even more so. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Professor uh, Moser. Uh, we do have a, a reception after this event, but we want to leave some uh, time for questions. If you, uh, anyone in the audience should have questions, I'll ask my panelists to come up here. Uh, there are two microphones on the sides. If uh, I would ask you to come and use them to uh, offer uh, any questions that you have. Question to Professor Yuri Shevchuk. Uh, in Ukraine, uh, we have a very interesting, uh, I would say, dialects, and they exist both in Western and Eastern Ukraine. In Eastern Ukraine, as, we, as you mentioned, people uh, often borrow words from Russian, and in Western Ukraine, people <coughs> borrow words uh, for generations from, let's say, Polish or German. So um, I'm wondering. Uh, if this understanding of dialect is something that is particular to Ukraine or in other nations, people have also define dialect as borrowing words from other languages and how that can be different from slang and what we see as uh, uh, constantly uh, innovation in languages such as French and German on different levels as slang. Uh, a short answer to this question is <clears throat> Dialects are basically a regional phenomenon, and uh, the way Ukrainian dialects historically, uh, we are in the presence of a 
<laughs> of a much greater authority on the subject than I am. Uh, three three um, groups of dialects uh, that, uh, that there are in Ukrainian language. And of course, uh, what happens in the dialect it depends on the territorial contiguity of that particular dialect with other uh, language groups. So, uh, of course, we, we should expect uh, things that are uh, typical of, let us say, uh, uh, south uh, southwestern Ukrainian dialects to be influenced, or, or many of them, by their language contacts with uh, with other language uh, communities. For instance, the the existence of the sound f that is typical of the dialects uh, of the uh, uh, southwestern uh, group, and that is not typical of uh, 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 U Ukrainian dialects of central Ukraine that uh, became basis for the Ukrainian norm. And therefore, for instance, the absence of the interpretation of, of the uh, uh, voice consonant v at the uh, final syllabic and uh, word position as a f as it is interpreted in Polish or in Russian, and instead uh, it's vocalization simply because there's there's no such an option. Uh, as opposed to dialect, uh, jargon or slang is a social phenomena more than it is. Uh, you might disagree. More, more than it is a, a territorial or geographical phenomena, and therefore we have jargons of musicians, of, uh, of thieves uh, that Horbach, for instance, investigated, jargons of uh, or slang of students that I bemoan, whose absence I bemoan so much, because I know something of the student slang in Polish, which is infinitely uh, creative and absolutely captivating. And so the, the same thing in Russian or in, uh, in English. And I heard a little bit of uh, incredibly, uh, from my conversation with a colleague who teaches uh, Slovak uh, and how rich their slang is. So uh, I don't know, that's there. Yes, uh, Just a very short commentary and then a question. Uh, uh, I conclude this, and I realize we've had had four speakers and covered many tasks and introduced on, and yet I feel uh, strangely unfulfilled about Shevardov and his meaning uh, to us. Uh, I think one of the, the, the crucial things that did come in a point is that uh, he, we read him. That is uh, much more than most scholars of generation, and I don't want to put linguistics in an abstruse category. Uh, Shevardov influenced uh, a few generations of the Ukrainian diaspora, certainly, and certainly through his writing uh, influenced, uh, influences Ukraine today. Uh, I think from my own field, I mean, our first cultural history of the 20th century in many ways, or one of our best was his history of the Ukrainian language of the 20th century, which of course was mentioned. Uh, uh, I think on many other levels, of Yuri Sherik uh, and waiting for articles to come out. Of, I don't want to exaggerate the number of people, but what was intellectual life of the Ukrainian immigration uh, happened under his influence. And so he became, at a certain level, legendary. And yet when I pick up his memoirs, I find a man who didn't seem to understand all he did. Uh, that is, who, uh, when he recounts what his relationship was, seems strangely unsatisfied in it uh, for someone who I think uh, had many reasons to uh, uh, not only be proud, but to take great comfort in, in what he had accomplished with that. And then on to the question part, uh, we've heard about his influence in uh, for our understanding of Ukrainian language and, and linguistics. Uh, and yet one of the things he would tell us is he was strangely isolated from the world of at least North American Slavic studies. Uh, of course, we have in his writings who are the villains of this piece. But I wonder if you would comment a little bit more on that. You know, if you were going to to typify what, how broad was his influence uh, as a linguist and a philologist? Uh, did really these, what he saw, 
as his exclusion for, for reasons of these attacks and, and, and internecine struggles really prevent generations of Slavis in North America and in Europe uh, from benefiting from his work. And this is to Professor Moser, obviously. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> so, um, Jaren, so this question is probably not uh, very simple. Uh, on the one hand, um, Shvilyov um, constantly published his uh, articles uh, with the best publishers. Uh, is it on? It's on, okay. Uh, on the one hand, Shevelyov uh, published his uh, studies with the best publishers uh, as for the books and in the best journals. Uh, so uh, he had the opportunity to, to reach a broad audience and um, um, so he was not prevented from reaching this audience uh, very actively. That's the one thing. Uh, the other thing is, um, and that's the second issue uh, that is of interest. It uh, was mentioned before, and you all know the story, that the attempt to, 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 to ruin his reputation, um, that was the uh, Jakobson Bilodit uh, thing. Um, and I, I may figure out, and uh, uh, Shvilyov confirms it in his memoirs and in other writings, that this did have an impact uh, in the world of Slavic studies, that, that he was uh, refuted by many uh, because of this fabricated story that uh, plot against him um, as if he had really collaborated with the Nazis, which is simply not true. Um, this is the second aspect, and this had a bad impact, uh, of course, in the field, and as we know, uh, even the field of Slavic linguistics uh, and linguists sometimes behave as if they were uh, more objective, more um, remote from the world of intrigues and this and that. That's simply not true. This did have an impact on Shevlyov and, and, and on his career uh, and on his um, um, impact in uh, the Slavic scholar of the world in general. Uh, even in practice, uh, as far as I remember, he was not he was not allowed to take part in uh, great congresses of uh, Slavists and this and that. They pick their uh, um, crews, right, the national committees, and this had an impact on this. That's the second issue. And the third issue is uh, not uh, Shvilyov uh, in particular, uh, but uh, Ukrainian studies as such, and Ukrainian linguistics as such. And this is probably the major issue. So, um, what is Slavic studies generally now? What was it then? What has it been? Largely, unfortunately, it's just uh, the wrong label. Slavic studies usually are not Slavic studies. They are Russian studies. And that's it, right? As for uh, uh, Shevlyov's impact uh, on um, uh, Russian studies, it's uh, also huge, but only in as much as uh, Shevlyov, uh, um, via Ukrainian, shows us to a much better extent what Russian studies really should be limited to. But uh, as for Russian studies as such, uh, Shulyov did not do that much, I would say. Um, so that's why uh, um, he is not so well known um, in Slavic studies. 
um, if it is a uh, Slavic studies meaning um, Russian studies, and that's uh, the narrow world of Slavic studies. On the other hand, not everything is so simple even in that regard. You heard that uh, this review, which I don't know as a text, was uh, the review mentioned by Professor Kipa, uh, was written by uh, Udolf, um, a German um, Slavist who is not really a Ukrainianist. So, uh, of course, you cannot generalize and you cannot say that only Ukrainianists um, take into account Shivlyov's works. Uh, so, uh, he did have an impact beyond uh, Ukrainian linguistics, uh, but um, his impact in Ukrainian studies is, is significantly greater than, than, uh, than uh, uh, anywhere else. Um, and of course, his prehistory of Slavic is underestimated, I guess. His prehistory of Slavic <coughs> touches upon uh, or uh, uh, um, um, encompasses all Slavic languages. Sorry for answering so long. Uh, I wanted to just just to say, uh, he does admit he does mention in his in his uh, uh, memories of the war with Jakobson about the whispering campaign that was uh, underway th that surrounded him, and uh, on occasion, uh, a doctoral student wanted to consult with him on, during a congress and then wouldn't show up for, for the meeting, for the arranged meeting. Uh, but also I wanted to say this, the, f the very fact that he is writing this body of work on something that in mainstream American Russian uh, linguistics is not even recognized as a valid subject matter of linguistic inquiry, I mean the Ukrainian language as a language in its of itself, puts the uh, mainstream Russian linguistics before a very uncomfortable dilemma. You need to address that issue. And my impression is, little that I know, uh, that uh, they were not prepared to confront it. And so the fact that Shebelov is here with, with these very solid, uh, the phonology of Ukrainian alone is absolutely majestic. Mm -hmm. And it reads, trust me, it reads wonderfully even to, uh, well, I, I wouldn't call myself non-specialist, but how, that, that was something that Shebelov created, this, this kind of a dilemma. And I think they didn't handle it very well they still don't know how to handle it. Better a little bit, but still there's this inertia of where do you, what do you do with something that takes away from the centrality of, of Russian studies as this hegemonic presence in, in American Slavistics. Just Thank one you. sentence, he's very rarely quoted in, in uh, our works from Russian studies, and uh, he's not quoted where he should be quoted. Uh, Professor Zanink, what do you want to? Uh, of having been so strongly pulled down by Jakobson, who perpetuated uh, that uh, bad opinion of, of Shevelov as a Nazi, held back many serious scholars from dealing with Shevelov or defending Shevelov or even positively approaching him as, a, as, a, as 
for what he did. You quite said it reads like a like a mystery story. His Slavic uh, studies is a brilliant piece of work, and he most scholars say that it is. They say that they approve. They say that he was a brilliant scholar. If you speak with, 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 but no one deals with it. No one deals with him as a scholar on the level that he should be dealt with. I was one of his students, so I remember him, how brilliant he was in class, how students came from all over the world. From Canada, we used to have two or three students who came just for his lectures at Columbia from Canada. Sometimes he had as many as 20 students in one of his uh, classes on, uh, on, on, on Slavic uh, linguistics. And he was charismatic as a teacher and as a professor. So. If I would, could add a postscript, uh, I'm not a specialist. I was not in literature nor linguistics, but I did spend almost a decade at Columbia in the history department. And uh, I must say that he was highly revered and respected by scholars in my department. Mm -hmm. uh, no one, for example, would ever accuse him of being not uh, of being non-objective. Um, uh, so uh, he was respected by students, but in particular, very few students in my department knew him. But as far as professors are concerned, they all had very high respect. Thank you, uh, Dr. Prozik. Uh, we probably should be winding down. Uh, uh, Yes, well, maybe time for one last question. Uh, please use the microphones. Uh, <laughs> I don't know what the aversion to microphones is here, but they're, they're a lot of fun. <laughs> Make you louder. Thank you. This isn't actually a question to any one specific panelist. It's more of a comment, or I should say a request of clarification regarding Shevilov's biography. Um, I don't know if this question or issue has been discussed because unfortunately I came a little later, but I was just wondering if someone can clarify the following. Um, according to Kubiovich's Encyclopedia Ukrinoznaustva, volume 10, page 3810, um, Yuri Shevilov is not actually a native of Kharkiv. He was born in Poland in a town called Lomja. And I was just wondering if anyone can comment on that according to this source. Well, the reason for that is that um, he ex Shevelov explains that in his memoirs, the particular situation. Uh, it was a, a political situation for, from which they, uh, in which they did not wish to get caught. And for someone with his ethnic background, um, it was not, um, it was better to have been born somewhere else. And so Poland was listed as his birth. But Chevalot clears that up in, in his memoirs, clearly saying uh, that I was born in Kharkiv, but for political, to, to uh, basically escape the possibility of political persecution, uh, my mother uh, wrote in a, a fake. Uh, place of his birth, and that his birth was in, in Kharkiv, and he documents that statement. So quite a few, including my husband, were born in Poland. They just falsified the materials. A few people got together, signed up the certificate, that they knew this person that was born in Poland, such and such a town and city. And uh, you used it for a long time. And many times, it was before you came to the United States that you admitted that you actually were from the original Soviet Union. Because for the fear of repatriation, <coughs> especially in certain sections, in certain zones, uh, in the English zone, for example, they would simply come by trucks and they would take all from the, from the uh, camps. They would get all the ones who were former Soviet citizens and take them uh, okay, I think uh, we'll leave that as our last comment. I want to thank you all for coming tonight. I invite you to come tomorrow. Two presenters uh, that were presenting tomorrow just walked in, so I'm good. There's only one missing. 
Uh, but we have fascinating uh, three panels tomorrow and of course an evening with Sidi Jadan, the Ukraine Museum. So I invite you all to come. I invite you all to the reception that's waiting for us just outside. And I'd like to thank all our panelists today uh, once more for a wonderful <laughs>